All right, thank you for indulging me with that. If you wouldn't mind standing with me as we give honor and attention to the Word of God. We're going to be in 1 Samuel chapter 14 today. It says this. Now it happened one day that Jonathan, the son of Saul, said to the young man who bore his armor, Come, let us go over to the Philistines' garrison that is on the other side. But he did not tell his father. And Saul was sitting in the outskirts of Gibeah under a pomegranate tree, which is in Migron. The people who were with him were about 600 men. Ahijah, the son of Ahatub, Ichabod's brother, the son of Phinehas, the son of Eli, the Lord's priest in Shiloh, was wearing an ephod. But the people did not know that Jonathan had gone. Between the passes by which Jonathan sought to go over to the Philistines' garrison, there was a sharp rock on one side and a sharp rock on the other side. And the name of one was Bozes, and the name of the other, Sena. The front of one faced toward Michmash, and the other southward toward Gibeah. Then Jonathan said to the young man who bore his armor, Come, let us go over to the garrison of these uncircumcised, and may it be that the Lord will work for us, for nothing restrains the Lord from saving by many or by few. So his armor bearer said to him, Do all that is in your heart. Go then, here I am with you, according to your heart. Then Jonathan said, Very well, let us cross over to these men, and we will show ourselves to them. Verse 9. If they say to us, Wait until we come to you, then we will stand in our place and not go up to them. But if they say to us, Come up to us, then we will go up. For the Lord has delivered them into our hand, and this will be a sign to us. So both of them showed themselves to the garrison of the Philistines, and the Philistines said, Look, the Hebrews are coming out of the holes where they have hidden. Then the men of the garrison called to Jonathan and his armor bearer and said, come up to us and we will show you something. Jonathan said to his armor bearer, come after me for the Lord has delivered them into the hand of Israel. And Jonathan climbed up on his hands and knees with his armor bearer after him. Then they fell before Jonathan. As he came after him, his armor bearer killed them. The first slaughter which Jonathan and his armor bearer made was about 20 men within about half an acre of land. And there was a trembling in the camp and in the field and among all the people. The garrison and the raiders also trembled. The earth quaked so that it was very great with trembling. And Saul and the watchmen of Gibeah looked and there was a multitude melting away. And they went here and there. And then Saul said to the people who were with them, who's missing? Saul said, bring the ark of God here. Now it happened when Saul was talking to the priest that the noise in which the camp of the Philistines continued to increase. And Saul said, withdraw your hand. And then all the people who were with Saul assembled and they went to battle. And indeed, every man's sword was great with his neighbor and there was great confusion. Moreover, the Hebrews who were with the Philistines before that time who went up with them into the camp from the surrounding country, they also joined the Israelites who were with Saul and Jonathan. Likewise, all the men of Israel who had hidden in the mountains of Ephraim when they had heard that the Philistines fled, they also followed hard after them in the battle. Listen to this. So the Lord saved Israel that day, and the battle shifted. Come pray with me. Father, we thank you for your goodness and your grace and your mercy that is new every morning. Oh, God, we love you today. We're grateful for your presence in this place. We're grateful for your word. Holy Spirit, speak to us today. Open our hearts and minds. Give us an encounter with you, Lord, that leaves us changed from this place. God, fill our lives till all that people see is you. Glorify your name, and we thank you for your word today. Touch us, minister to us, mold us and shape us for the glory of your son, Jesus. For his name we pray, amen. You may be seated. So I know we just read a lot of scripture but I wanted to set a context for you because when Pastor Randy and I were talking a few weeks ago about a message to share in this place, I knew, I knew, I'm like, I gotta share this word. I know where y'all are at. I know what God has been doing in your lives. I, I sense that this is a shift in the, in the spirit and what God is doing. And, and I, I just knew that this word was specifically for this house when, uh, when I was speaking with Pastor Randy. So I wanna give you some context for this battle that we just read about. In 1 Samuel, the kingdom of Israel was in a shift. We had just, they had just uh, left uh, Egypt not too long ago. They had experienced the giving of the law of Mount Sinai. 
God had given them his commands. He had commissioned them into the promised land. And then we have hundreds of years of judges who are being raised up because Israel did not remain faithful to the covenant of God. So God had to send judges their way to help them get back into the covenant of God, renew their commitment to him, and also to deliver them from the enemies that were attacking them um, because they were not being faithful to God's covenant. And so God raised up judges. You might remember there was Gideon and Deborah. And we come to this season in time where God had anointed the prophet Samuel, who was called by God to be a judge for Israel. And it was a critical moment because this is, you know, remember in, in 1 Samuel is when we have this shift from the judges to the kings. And so here we are after Samuel had passed and um, the people of Israel had asked him for a king. God had anointed Saul, the tribe of Benjamin, to be the king over Israel. And we see here kind of the rise and fall of Saul's kingdom right here in this story. In 1 Samuel 13, we read that the Philistines come up to battle against Israel. It said that there were thousands of chariots and charioteers. The Bible says that the Philistine army covered the area like the sand on the seashore. Huge army. Huge. And the people of Israel, under their newly formed king, Saul, went out to meet them. As soon as they saw this huge army, they were like, oh, snap. We are in trouble. We need help. And they melted in fear. They saw the enemy, and they couldn't get their eyes off the enemy. The Bible says that some of them went to hide in caves and pits and mountains. They were so afraid of that enemy. The chapter that we just read, we read that even some of them went over and joined the enemy's camp. They were so scared of how large this enemy was. The Bible tells us that only 600 men remained with Saul in the kingdom of Israel. So that's the picture we're setting. 600 men, thousands taunting Israel, and they were in no rush to destroy them. They were like, yeah, just let them wait. We'll see how many more go hide in the caves. We'll see how many more run to the mountain passes. We'll see how many more come to us because they already know they're destroyed. And so they were roaring against the people of God. And so we read in this story that one day, Jonathan, son of Saul, said to his young armor bearer, come, let us go over to the Philistine outpost on the other side. But he did not tell his father. And that struck me today, and why I feel it's so important for Parkway Life Church, why I feel it's such an important principle that we get here in this moment, is that God doesn't need 600 men. God doesn't need a whole army. God doesn't need it, us at all. But he longs to partner with us. He longs to showcase his glory through a people he has designated his authority to. He looks for people who will say, not I, God, but you and me, we will go. And so we read that one day, Jonathan stood up. And this is my first point I want you to get in your spirit today, is that today is that one day where God is raising up leaders who are dissatisfied with the decline. God is raising up leaders who are dissatisfied with what they see in the culture, with what they see that's surrounding them, the enemies that roar against them. There's leaders that on the inside, they're saying, don't we have a covenant with a God who sits over everything, who has promised to not withhold anything from us, who's gave the blood of his son, who's given us authority, who's given us power? Don't we have an inheritance? Isn't this land ours? That's what Jonathan said. It says that one day he looked at his armor bearer, the one who carried his shield with him, and said, you know what? Don't we have a God that can save by many or by few? Don't we have a God who doesn't look at the decline and say, oh, no, what are we going to do? We have got a God who says, I'm looking for a people who stand in the face of decline and said, this is who my God is. He's never lost a battle, undefeated. And when the victory looks like the enemy has won, three days later, someone's coming out of the grave. 
That's the kind of faith we have. We don't have a wishy-washy faith. We don't have a mythical faith. We have a faith in a God who raises the dead, who breaks the chains, who brings miracles, signs, and wonders. That is not just what he does. That's who he is. And I'm passionate about this. Because in this day and age, it seems we have a lot of Christians who are so willing to look at the decline and let ourselves be defined by the decline. And say, oh God, look what's happening in our schools today. Oh God, look what's happening in our country today. Oh God, look what's happening in the political realm. We're going to hell in a handbasket. I don't know who says that anymore, but it, it's an old saying. But it... But if the spirit is there, the spirit of decline, the spirit of dissatisfaction, the spirit of what are we going to do? We're surrounded. Who will fight the battle? And then we listen to those maybe who have ideas of how we fight the battle with our intellect, with our reason, with our willpower. And they may even cloak it in spiritual language. But I'm telling you today, the answer is still the same. We've got a covenant with a God who called us his sons and daughters, who says from the beginning to the end, I am the first and the last. This is my world and you are my people. And my grace will meet with everyone. My love is for everyone. My transformation for everyone. This world knows it's broken. Our job is to remind them of the grace of God that heals the brokenness. Our job is to sit in that grace, to let that grace fill us, to flow through us, to the love of Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit. I've heard from this pulpit time and time again from the pastors here. They say, we've got to walk in that Christ confidence, that partnership with the Holy Spirit, so that when we walk into a situation, they know the decline is shifting. I feel hope rising. I feel, I feel when I get around these people that there's something greater for me. That I don't have to live the lie anymore. That the enemies that war against me can be scattered by the mention of the name of Jesus. I, I intended to give you some stats all on the decline of Christianity. And, and I, you know what? I don't think you need it. I think you know it. I think you know it. And, and I believe in stats. I believe they're helpful. They show us things that are, you know, help us to move and make decisions that will honor Christ. But I also just believe that the word of God never returns void. I also just believe that the plan of God and the purpose of God will not be thwarted. I love what the Bible says about the book of Samuel is because it says, for Samuel, not one of his words ever fell to the ground. God confirmed every word of the prophet Samuel. Now, we have a, we've gotten a word spoken to us better than the prophet Samuel. We have the word of Jesus Christ. The Bible says we have his blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. We have a testimony that is sure that we are adopted and fully his church. We are secure in our place before him. I'll give you one quick statistic. You know, we learn from our culture that the most engaged people in Christianity are from the ages of 4 to 14. 4 to 14, that's our window of time where they're so engaged, they're so religiously involved, they're so fruitful, they're so uh, able to talk about Jesus. I read a stat just the other day that over 50% of Gen Z, that's the generation that's in school right now, they, they want to hear about Jesus. That may be shocking to you, but over 50% are willing to hear about Jesus. They want to hear about Jesus. They understand that their lives are not just flesh and bone. They believe that there's a spiritual world and that it's real, that it impacts them. They want to hear about him. They need him. Conversely, the group that's fastly leaving their faith, that after the first year of college, many of them are not Christians anymore, are that 20 to 38 window. So beginning with the 4 to 14, just a few years later from 20 to 38, are the least involved in church. And my God, 
I'm telling you, just that was shared in this place. It's not a huge strategy we need to change. It's a testimony we need to share. My God, every time I'm here, I tell folks, I said, don't die with the victory. Whatever victory God gave you, you better share it. He healed your marriage. Oh, we need to hear it. He made a breakthrough of your finances. Testify about it. He has kids that he gave you that have shepherds that are loving Jesus, that are serving, that are members of their community. My God, what a glorious testimony that is. And we need it. Our young people are dying to hear it. They need it. And so if you're sitting here and you're thinking, God, how could you use me? I don't know what to do. I don't know. I don't have a pulpit. I don't have a mic. You don't need any of that. All you need, all you have is all you need. He's given you a testimony. He's given you a spirit of adoption. He's called you by a new name. And when you're walking in that, and you can get a young person around you, someone you mentor, someone you just pour into, oh, they long for it, and they want to hear about it. And so what I'm telling you today is all you have is all you need. It's a testimony. All you need, maybe you have a little cash, bring them out for a burger. I told you, I had a, I had a ministry here. It was Dairy Queen and basketball. I, I no lie, every, every day after church, we'd go play some basketball out, outside here, and then we'd go to Dairy Queen. And I got into these kids' lives, and I can just tell you from personal experience, um, so many of them are still loving, serving the Lord. And every time I come down here, folks, the first thing I do is I call them. First thing I do is I call them. I say, hey, how you doing? Let's go, let's go get something to eat. Tell me about your life. Tell me what's going on. Tell me what's new. Because first testimonies have come out of their life. And because I know they still need love and they still need support. And for many of them, I'm the only spiritual father they have. Listen, I'm not even in Naples anymore. And so there's room for you, folks. There's room for you at the table. There's room for you in lives. And if you need help with that, I'll t trust me, I'll give you this blueprint. Dairy Queen and basketball. You know what I mean? Like, whatever it is for you, God will use you. He'll use you to pour into these young folks. But he wants you to realize. He wants you to know. You got to get dissatisfied with the decline. If you're willing to live under today's present bondage, you will never have the victory that God's calling you to in the next season. You will never be able to rise up over and overcome that giant because you have a yesterday faith for a now season. And God's given you so much victory. And I know it just he just lovingly says, just share it. Just tell them what I did. Just show them love. Just be around them. Let them see your spirit. Let them see your family. Invite them into your home. Some of the most impactful times I've had here, just being around the coffee table with someone. Them sharing what God's done in their life. The Bible says that Jonathan had the mindset, nothing can hinder the Lord from saving, whether by many or by few. And I just wonder if there's a few people here today that are willing to hear the word of God today. Let that become their mission and their mandate to say, I know a God who can save through me. And I don't care how few, how little, how much I don't think I have. I know if I give him my little, he'll magnify his name and it'll become a lot. Second point I want to get to you today. The Lord our God is a covenant-keeping God. He's a covenant-keeping God. I know that's an old-timey word, covenant. We don't use it as much anymore, um, except for marriages. We talk about a marriage covenant. A covenant simply means a promise, a commitment, a deep intertwining of things that could never be undone. That's what covenant means. And if anything today, I think that's one of our primary messages to this world, that we're a covenanted people. Because we have a world that so easily wants to just detach things that have been covenanted by God together. Think of the attack against marriages. Think of the attack just against relationships. Saying so you could just, you know, treat people however you want them to treat. You know, if they're not good for your life, cut them off. You can, you can live shallow lives and shallow relationships. And we just see how that's reeling in our culture. 
It's torn us away from families. It's torn us away from real intimacy and relationships and partnerships. It's become a place where the enemy has just slowly snuck in those ideas where it's like, you do you. Don't be committed and committed to anybody. You're free to be as you are. And as soon as someone has requirements or responsibilities of you, then you know what? That's oppressive. You need to take that off. And yet we have a God who says from the beginning, from Genesis to Revelation, you will be my people and I will be your God. You will be my people and I will be your God. You will be my people and I will be your God. And I will be committed to you. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. As far as the east is from the west, I've cast your sins from you. I've clothed you in my love. I rejoice over you with singing. That's what the word of God says. He likens our covenant, our commitment to a marriage and the bride of Christ as his beautiful bride he's waiting to return to. He's longing for. He says, oh, I can't wait to be with my people to share my glory and my love with them, to place them in places they could never be without me, to just let them reflect my glory and receive my love, and in that they become themselves. I was talking with some youth recently, and they're like, you know, Pastor, I've been going through a really rough time, well, you know, just walking through some things, some depression, some anxiety, you know, and I'm just really focusing on myself. And as a father to them, I'm, I'm lovingly saying, I get it, man. I know you're walking through a valley. I know you're walking through a shadow. But here, let me tell you something. You can never work on yourself without Jesus. Because Jesus is the one who made you. And Jesus is the one who knows you. And Jesus is the one in whom you fully become yourself. You want to find yourself? Find Jesus. And in finding Jesus, you'll find out who you are. And so what I love about it is just, just those simple things begin to unearth some of those seeds and those lies of the enemy. And they just begin to give them a solid foundation and a solid ground to stand on. And I don't care if they're praying for three minutes. They're talking with the king who's covenanted with them. And he's able to change and shift and mold and shape them in a way that we never could. Seat them in heavenly places. The Lord our God is a covenant-keeping God. He needs nothing or no one to help him or remind him to be faithful to his commitments. That's good news. For we are a people who are prone to wander. We're forgetful. We're lazy. We're wavering. But just one glimpse, just one glimpse of his glory, one, one inkling of the human heart for the promise of Christ, one moment in his presence, one whisper of his word who says, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I know you. That'll cause you to stand up and to take ground, to believe again, to be stirred again. In Jonathan's case, it was a physical battle where he heard from the word of God and says, you know what? God's with us. We can go up against any enemy. But for all God's people, the first battle always remains the same. Who will we covenant with? Who will we partner with? Whose report will we believe? Will it be in fear? Will it be anxiety? Will it be the flow of culture? Will it be the individual narrative that we make up in our own mind? Will it be the world? Will it be the flesh? Will it be the devil? Will we covenant with that? Will we partner with that? Or it will be the gospel? The promise fulfilled and being fulfilled in Jesus Christ. The Bible says there are two great calls in the Bible. Two great yearnings of the human spirit. The first one is in Galatians. Where the Bible says that God has sent a spirit of adoption into our hearts. Where we cry from the depths of our hearts, Abba, Father. Abba, Father. You're my father. You're the daddy I was longing for. You're the one in whom I find completeness. You're the family that I've been longing for all of my life. Even if I didn't grow up in a Christian family, you're my home base. You're who sees me. You're who knows me. You're who created me. And from the inside of my heart, I just sense there's something crying out to a father. In our culture today, one of the greatest spirits that we face is the orphan spirit. That people who don't know how to cry out, Abba, Father, are crying out for everything else. Saying, I don't know who I am. Who am I? The culture will be quick to give him an answer. We're here we are, the church of the living God. 
who God has placed the spirit of adoption in us, whose God has given us a clarion call to say, you're a son, you're a daughter. A covenant has been made by the blood of Jesus Christ. It can never be taken away. His blood is for you. He is with you. And here I am as a testimony of that. Because I didn't grow up in a Christian home. I didn't grow up with a mother and father who told me about Jesus. Who told me about the love of Christ and what he did for me on that cross. But through the ministry of the church. Fathers and mothers and brothers and sisters came alongside me and, and, and share with the young 15-year-old boy, there is hope for you, young man. There's a father for you, young man. I still remember to this day, I was at Six Flags Over Georgia. It was a theme park, and they had Christian speakers, and I was there with the youth group, a lost, unsaved kid. I was there for the girls and the roller coasters. I ain't going to lie. I was there. I was like, man, we'll ride the Hulk. But a preacher got up, and he started declaring the truth of the word of God and the story of the prodigal son and about how the father ran to his son and his brokenness and sin and his shame. And he, even though his son had turned his back on him, and this preacher said, and that's what our father has done for you. He's running towards you. His love is for you. He wants to adopt you. He wants to make you his. And I remember at 15 years old just breaking and weeping and saying, is this for me? Is this for me? Is that what you're calling me for? And I just remember weeping tears. I couldn't even just hold back and say, God, I want you. I want you because you want me. You want me, God. And there's something on my heart that says, Abba, Father, is that you calling me? And years later, as I, as I kind of went in and out of church and struggled in middle school and high school, got into some things that I never should have been involved in. I remember being in a church because I was all I knew to go back to. And I'm praying in the sanctuary, and I'm filled with so much guilt and so much shame. And I'm falling asleep in prayer because I could barely keep my eyes awake. And, and I hear God speak to me. And he just called my name. He said, Peter. I don't know about you, but when God calls your name, nothing else matters. Because he led me to this verse in Isaiah chapter 43. And Isaiah chapter 43 says, Do not fear, O Israel, do not be dismayed. For I am the Lord your God, I have redeemed you, and I have called you by name. And I'm not here today with something new for you. I'm here to you to say God's called you by name. He knows your story. He's made a commitment to you, a covenant in his blood that will never be taken away. And many of you here, you might have that orphan spirit that's climbed up on the inside that says I'm lacking something. That there's something in my life that's missing. That I'm incomplete. And I just want to hear to say to you today, there's a spirit here that's saying and speaking a better word over your life, saying, I'm here, child. I did not make a mistake when I made you. I am your father, and you are my kid, and I'm here for you. The battle always remains the same for us. Who will we covenant with? Who will we respond to? The clarion call of God or the clamoring of the enemy? My final point today. Your pursuit of God is paced by your people. Your pursuit of God is paced by your people. What do I mean? Who are you going with? Who's walking alongside you in your journey with Christ? Are they people with victory? Are they people who, uh, who know the voice of the living God? Are they people who know the word? Are they, are, they, are they the folks around you that are bringing people alongside of them who are leading folks? I don't just mean in the church, I mean in their workplace. I mean, are there kids learning what it means to know Jesus? Are they encouragers? Because I promise you, you cannot covenant with the God of the Bible and then partner with people who live without victory. 
Because pretty soon, their dysfunction will become be your dysfunction. And what I've learned in all these years of following Christ is I need people in my life who are passionately pursuing Christ so that together we will pull up others. The Bible says that Jonathan said to his armor bearer, let's go over to the other side. Let's go over, you and me. The first thing we read is that the Lord goes before him. That's always what happens for us. Whenever we're willing to take a step, just know God's already gone before you. He's established the journey and the road for you before you even get there. As Pastor Randy will always say this, there are blessings assigned to your path. They're waiting for you when you get there. Step into your obedience. So John and his armor bearer, they're the first group that goes up against this large army. And you read the story. The Bible says there's a trembling in the camp. And these two guys kill 20 people. An earthquake comes. Everyone starts fleeing and scattering. Two guys! An army that is as vast as the sand on the seashore. And God uses two guys who are covenanted with the God of Israel who said, you know what? We're together. You're my people. I'm your people. We're going to pursue Christ. We're going to go. God does what only he could do. Second group that comes are Saul and the army who's with them. Remember, there's 600 men chilling under a tree. They first are like, what do we do? Who's missing? What do we do? Oh, it's just two guys? Well, we, we better get started. They look over again. Everyone's fleeing. Everyone's running away. And then it says they joined the battle in hot pursuit. Then they got up and they joined with us. And I just have a sense that Park for Life Church, this is a prophetic mandate that is being spoken over you today. God has called you through your pastors, through two people who are saying God is raising us up for a transition that's going to be a transformation for the city of Naples. He's given you a mission and a mandate. And they're saying, we're going to go. We're going to go to the other side. We're going to go. Nothing can hinder the Lord from saving by many or by few. I believe God has given that over this house. But which group will you be in? Will you be the ones who say, you know what? Yeah, God's a covenant-keeping God. God can do what he says he wants to do. God can save sons and daughters from afar. He can empty hell and fill heaven in Naples as it is in heaven. We're going to be a part of that first group that says, we see. We see that. We're going to go. We're going to go. Or like Saul and his men, you're going to be like, you know what? I'm going to wait till the earthquake comes. I'm going to wait till I see the enemy scattering in every direction. And then I'll join. I'm telling you, folks, God's got a blessing for those who are ready to go. He's got a blessing for those who are ready to go. But your faith has got to be in a covenant-keeping God that has saved and set you apart, and then you're willing to steward your testimony. There's two more groups that joined the battle. There were the Hebrews who had joined the enemy's camp. The Bible says that as they saw that the Israelites were gaining victory, they said, oh my gosh, we're on the losing side. We better go right back over here. Oh yeah, we're over here with Israel now. What now? You running scared now? Right now, that's what we have going on in the church. There are people who are so entrenched in the enemy's camp, and they don't even know it. Or they do know it, and they're waiting. They're waiting to see who will have the final victory. But I'm telling you, church, our God has never lost a battle. Undefeated. Indisputed. And he's waiting for those to start getting the victory so that those who are in the enemy's camp say, you know what? I'm on the wrong side. I better go right back over here where the God of Israel is moving in the earth today. And then it says we have this last group, the group who were hidden in the mountains and the caves. Because you remember, they taunted Jonathan and his armor bearer, and they said, look, the Hebrews are coming out of the caves, the rocks and the places that they've hidden in. That fourth group was the last group that was so far behind, but they ran and they joined the battle. And I just believe that we're, we're declaring right now prophetically is over every generation that's going to be coming from now till Christ returns. I don't care what group they're a part of. I just want them to have the victory. I just want them to be in the battle because God has already fought the most precious battle 
He's defeated hell. He's defeated sin. He's defeated the grave. And he rose again with life forevermore. And he's given you authority, power, adoption, forgiveness, a new place, a new name, a new mantle, a new mandate, a generation that's going to break everything off your family. It's going to save nations and countries. Not because you're great, but because he's great. Not because it's our kingdom, but it's his kingdom. Not because it's our church, but his church. And my God, if I won't be a part of the group that says, who can stop the Lord from saving by many or by few? I'm going to go. And I'm just going to share what he's done in my life. I'm going to let myself be a son or a daughter adopted and fully his. I'm going to share my testimony. I'm going to live by faith. Whatever my pastors ask me to do, I'm going to do it with joy because it's not for them, it's for him. I don't care if it's stacking chairs or getting people in the parking lot or walking with umbrellas, whatever it is, God, I want to be a part of it because I can promise you when eternity comes, you will never be upset or discouraged by what you gave to God. In fact, when you see Christ in his full glory, you're going to say, why did I hold on to so many things? Why did I let these little things in my job or in my family or whatever it was hold me back from giving everything to you? You gave it all for me. And so the chief question today is who will you covenant with? Who will be your people? Because they are going to determine your pursuit. What are you going to step into today? Come on, tell your neighbor, the battle has shifted. Come on, tell them, the battle has shifted. It shifted in this place. I sense it by the Spirit of Almighty God. And he raised me up just to tell you, just to remind you. And you're here for it. You're here for it. You're here for it. He's got an assignment over your life. I'm going to ask the prayer team, anyone that wants to come and join, just be a prayer for here, that those might have a need in their life, that those who just know through this message, something that was shared, something that the Holy Spirit is doing in your life, you know you need to respond. Because if anything you know about a battle is there's no one sitting on the sidelines. At some point, you're engaged in the battle. It's coming. We don't have an opportunity to, to just play games. so fresh on this because in my region there's been a revival that's broken out just a few hours away in Kentucky at the Asbury Revival that broke out and touched so many lives and so I saw the power of God, what it could do and touch and heal and restore many people from Tennessee were going to Kentucky coming back down, fresh fire, fresh anointing, healings, miracles, signs and wonders and I was like thank God a few months later A few miles from my house, an armed gunman went into the Covenant School, killed six people, three children. My God, we're in a battle. My God, we're in a battle. And the freedom and the victory is already here. That's the thing. Like, the freedom is already guaranteed. It's, it's for us. And so I'm not saying there's any quick fixes. I'm just saying there's a God who sees and knows all. And he's willing. He's willing. He's willing. He's willing. He's willing to move in the earth like never before. The Bible just says that the eyes of the Lord search to and fro throughout the earth looking for those whose hearts are committed to him because he wants to pour out strength. He wants to pour out glory. He's just looking for vessels. He's looking for full hearts. He's looking for people who are saying, God, here's the brokenness. Take it and heal it. Here's the dysfunction. Here's the sin. Have it, Lord. Have it, Lord. Have it, Lord. Have it, Lord. Whatever you want to do, have it, Lord, because I just want you. I just want you. Come and fill me till all they see is you. Church, that's what the Lord is looking for today. And so I want to open this altar because I still believe that the altar is where God does alterations. That's where God does changes and shifts. 
Maybe it's not just for something that's going through in your life. Maybe you know someone who's going through a battle. And if you've ever fought through something, you know how important it is for someone to come alongside saying, I'm fighting with you, sister. I'm fighting with you, brother. So these altars are open. These altars are open for God and for you to meet with him because he's calling you now. And so I want to invite the elders, the prayer team to come up because we're going to stand alongside you. We're going to go with you. We're going to go with you. Would you stand with me as I pray for you today? Oh, Holy Spirit, you come. Would you come, God? Oh, we hear you moving in this place. Oh, Jesus, you're all we want. You're all we need. We love you, Lord. We Is anyone here under the sound of my voice that has not yet given their life to Jesus Christ? We want to invite you to come. Just come and someone will pray with you. I'll pray with you. This is a moment for you to say, I'm done fighting my own battle. God's here for you. He's here to adopt you as his, as his own. So the altar is open for you. Jesus, 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 Jesus,
Come back to your first love. Come back to the cross today. He's here for you. He loves you. I want to speak a blessing over you. Remind you that he is with you. That he is for you. And nothing can stand against you when there's a God who's called you by name. So Father, I pray your blessing right now over your people. God, may they rejoice in the hills and the valleys. May they go out in singing and come back in joy. Oh God, may you establish marriages and homes and families, businesses, God, dreams and visions and destinies. Oh Holy Spirit, I pray you outpour in a supernatural way over every home, over every life, over every addiction, over every family. God, break every curse. God, break every chain. In the mighty name of Jesus, may you be glorified. May you be magnified. Oh God, may the glory of Christ come and fill us now with fresh fire, fresh anointing, fresh power. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. 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 Jesus. Last night the Lord woke me up. This is when planning what I was going to share in my notes, but I just feel like it's, it's relevant right now for this gathering. He told me, don't expect first love results when you don't have first love priorities. Don't expect first love results when you don't have first love priorities. And I just sense the Holy Spirit wanted me to share that here in this moment. Because I've, I've been married to my beautiful wife for almost 13 years. And even now, to this day, I say, you know what? Lord, how can I have a better and stronger marriage with this woman? I want to have a marriage that glorifies you. And he always talks to me about priorities. He always talks to me about priorities. He always talks to me about date night and listening to the things that matter to her and working on the things that we know to work on. And God says about his church, there's one thing you lack. You've forgotten your first love. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I just, I just sense that in my Holy in the Spirit speaking to me today, just saying, God has first love results for Parkway Life Church. When, when He is our first love, there's no limit. There's no limit. There's no limit when He's our first love. But He also knows we need first love priorities. Yes. And so be here Friday night for prayer. <laughs> my God, be here Friday night. If you can't make one night a month, one Friday night a month, you need to reevaluate your priorities. One Friday night a month. Can't expect first love results when you don't have first love priorities. I'm gonna get off the stage here. Thank you for letting me be here. I just love y'all. Hopefully I get to hug every neck and kiss every baby and do all those things. But Pastor, thank you.